welcome. Thank you for tuning in to this channel. Um, I'm going to talk about something I think is, is very, very important in these last days. I'll just start out with this. When I became a Christian, a, as a brand new Christian, I remember running home from work and reading the Bible. The New Testament really was what I felt like the Lord had had me in. I just read the New Testament as a newborn babe in Christ. I was very undereducated. I had a total of two credits toward my high school diploma. I got saved October 5th of 97. This was over 25 years ago. Um, and the funny thing is, is the church I got saved in the only Bible, they were out of Bibles, the only Bible they had left to give me to take home, because when I got saved, they gave me a Bible, was an NIRV picture Bible. This is a very elementary Bible, which really was really good for me. It really helped me lay a good foundation. The, the reading of it was very simply, and it was, it was good spiritual milk for a newborn babe in Christ. And um, I just read it, and I read it, and I read it. And I fell in love with the Word of God as I read it. The men of God in the Bible became my heroes. I, I love those men. Paul, Peter, I love reading about them. And um, as I continued going to church and growing in the Lord, I started seeing t-shirts, you know, you know. If this car is unmanned, the rapture has happened. And, and all these pre-tribulation rapture t-shirts, and I always brought a little confusion, and I never really understood what they were talking about until I started learning more about this so-called secret rapture. Now, keep in mind, I had come out of Mormonism. So as a newborn babe in Christ, I, had, I was understanding the falseness of Joseph Smith. And I understood the dangers when Jesus said, if a blind man follows a blind man, both fall into the pit. So I understood that truth is very imperative. And so I just studied those things out. And I, I never understood, nor have I ever seen, the pre-tribulation doctrine in Scripture. And it just, it never rang true with what I had read. And then four years ago, three years ago, I stumbled onto Pastor Joe Schimmel, and I was like, wow, there's someone who can see, right? He really does a great job of laying out the biblical accounts of the Lord's return. And it's all so simple in scripture. And Pastor Joe Schimmel for years, for years offered $10,000 to anybody that could show him one verse in all of scripture that showed a secret rapture that was to happen seven years before the day of the Lord, okay? And sure enough, there ain't one scripture in there. But I think this is more important because I've been in a lot of churches and people just play it off as a secondary issue. Well, it's okay. And they're really making light of it. Keep in mind the Apostle Paul had spoke of those Judaizers who were still preaching circumcision. Circumcision, I'm sorry. He, was, he said of them that he wished they would go ahead and castrate themselves. So these little secondary issues that we just seem to take so lightly here in the United States of America are really a major problem. And I want to break down the reasons for that today. This is a very important subject not to be taken lightly, you guys. We're getting ready to ride through some hard times, and Scripture tells us so. So we're going to dive into it. We're going to dive into it. Paul took truth and doctrine very, very seriously. The majority of the letters in the New Testament, all the letters in the New Testament really focus on right living and good doctrine. The importance of truth, you guys. And when we go through hard times, we're going to have to hang on to truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. In the early 1800s, Joseph Smith came out and started the cult of Mormonism. Charles Taze Russell came out and started the cult of Jehovah Witnesses. And Margaret and Darby came out with this pre-tribulation rapture theory. Is If all historians I know who studied this out, and I've studied it out myself, the earliest findings we can find of this teaching was in the 1800s. So this pre-tribulation rapture theory is a Johnny-come-lately doctrine. The Lord never spoke of it. None of the apostles ever spoke of it. The Old Testament prophets never spoke of it. Nowhere in Scripture, none of our early church fathers ever taught a pre-tribulation rapture. It didn't come out until the 1800s, you guys. And so if we just go through Scripture, we can see the simplicity of that which is in Christ. How everything is laid out 
if we would just pay attention. It sounds like they're cutting the lawn over there. I hope that ain't too much background noise. But anyways, we will start out in Matthew 24. This won't take long. Now, as, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Jesus privately saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So here's a warning. They ask him the question. The very first thing that Jesus says to them is take heed. Watch out. For many are going to come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many. So there's going to be much deception. And Paul talks about that too and we'll get there. Jesus said in verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That, that word nation is from the Greek word, word ethnos, which is where we get our term ethnicity. So this is talking about race wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. It's also talking about global na national wars. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. <clears throat> Verse 9. It hasn't mentioned a rapture yet. Let's, let's keep looking for that, okay? Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. He's talking to the church. And kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will betray one another, and will hate one another. Verse 11, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. we got to endure through it, y'all. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Listen up. The Lord's church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but he will keep us through the fourth quarter. He's not going to pull us out. Okay? He's not going to pull us out. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. <clears throat> Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. So here in verse 15, Jesus is saying, you will see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay? If we're not here, we couldn't see him. Okay? And you know what? I'm going to jump over to Daniel 7.21 real quick, and then we'll jump back over here. because he's, So Jesus is saying, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Let's see what Daniel the prophet says about this. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 21. As I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints. Now, pre-tribulationalists, post-tribulationalists, nobody's going to argue with the fact that this is the Antichrist, this little horn right here. Okay, so this is the Antichrist, and this is Daniel the prophet prophesying of this, and the Lord's putting a stamp of approval on it. Scripture does not contradict Scripture. It's a beautiful thing. Daniel 7.21, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them. The Antichrist is making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Remember Jesus told Pontius Pilate, you have no authority over me, but which that my Father has given you. Okay? God is going to allow this to happen, and we're called to be a witness through it. And if you look up that word witness in the original Greek form, it means martyr. You guys, when we're baptized, when we come to Christ, we're baptized into his death that we no longer live. But it is that Christ that lives through us. And in martyrdom, God is glorified. Okay? We have to make a decision here. Nobody wants to be martyred. But if we love the Lord, we're not going to deny him. And we are called to stand strong through it. <clears throat> Daniel 7, 21, as I was watching... And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. 
remember this because when we get to Revelation 13, we're going to see that John the Apostle agreed with it. So Daniel prophesied it. Jesus put a stamp of approval on it. Paul does. And also John in Revelation 13. It's a beautiful thing how Scripture comes together and it's all in agreement. Verse 22, Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So the Antichrist will have authority over the saints. He will prevail against the saints, not spiritually, just physically, because we're going to be proclaiming the gospel. We're going to be resisting the mark. We're going to be standing up saying, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Until the Ancient of Days came, okay, until the coming of the Lord, this is after the tribulation. <clears throat> and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So that's what Daniel said about it. Back to Matthew 24. Jesus said, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So if the Lord just allowed this to continue, everybody would just die. That's how angry and mean-spirited people are going to be. Verse 23. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So all throughout these scriptures we're going to be going through, you pay attention to the warnings against deception. And the warnings usually come with, with signs and wonders. Miracle signs and wonders. You guys, we don't follow miracle signs and wonders. We follow truth. Jesus is the way, and he is the truth, and he is the life. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth is what we're going for here. Immediately after, verse 29, the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. So after the tribulation, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, nothing secret, with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Thanks. And, and this is how the Lord did it. Yes, this is in chronological order. This is in chronological order. Make no mistake about it. Jesus knows we are not the, not the brightest bulbs in the box. So he lays it out simply for us so that we can understand. There's nothing tricky in the Lord's scripture to us. So after the tribulation, then the, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with the sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, that's the rapture, from the four winds, elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, that's the rapture, it's going to be global. After the tribulation, you guys, we've got to endure to the end, he says. So that is Matthew 24 on the subject matter. There's, there's no rapture from verse 1 until the very end in verse 31. 
Okay, then it goes into the parable of the fig tree. But when he's talking about that, the coming of the Son of Man, that's how it's laid out. And it's after the tribulation. Look, we either believe Jesus or we either believe Schofield. Two facts that contradict each other cannot both be true. Okay, let's see what the Apostle Paul said about it. We're going to jump over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, Paul is encouraging the church here. We're going to start in verse 13. Paul is telling them, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Do not be unaware. Don't be ignorant. Jesus said, Beware. Jesus said, Watch out. Jesus warned of much deception. Paul's saying, Don't be ignorant. In other words, we got to pay attention. we got to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and our strength. We can't be ignorant. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, he's talking about those who have died in Christ, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, this is not a secret rapture, will by no means precede those who have died in Christ, who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, nothing quiet, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Remember, Jesus said there would be a trumpet also. So this is talking about the same event that the Lord spoke about in Matthew 24. And then Paul says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So pay attention here. This is the first resurrection, okay? The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain. Notice, it's not we who were raptured up seven years prior. It's we who are alive and remain. This is the first resurrection. I, I need you to pay it and remember that because we're going to study out when the first resurrection is at the end of the book of Revelation. So keep that in mind as we continue forward. We're going to jump over to 2 Thessalonians. I've talked to people on this. They have tried to twist this so miserably, okay, uh, making a mess of things. But the deal with 2 Thessalonians, and we'll also notice that Paul says in here, remember I told you these things before. So Paul had many false teachers following him around twisting his words, trying to change scripture. And so he was always debating that. He was always exposing false teachers and trying to make sure that the church was grounded in truth, persevering in truth, and seeking the Father in spirit and in truth. So he's, a false teaching had got into the church. So Paul taught them in 1 Thessalonians, Word had gotten to Paul that these guys were, were getting some kind of strange theologies that the Lord had already come. So he's writing to bring to remembrance what he had already taught them and expands on this event, the same event he talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4. He's going to expand on it a little bit. And he says here, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if it was from us, as though the day of Christ had already come. So Paul's telling them, if somebody comes up and they say they, they're in the spirit, or, or they got a word of God, or, or they write a letter, if it's contradicting what is already written, be away with it. And these guys apparently were teaching preterism. They're saying that the day of Christ had already come. A little different than preterism, but pretty much the same. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. Every time this subject matter is brought up, it comes with much warning about deception. For that day, he's talking about the day of the Lord. As he makes very clear in verse 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So he's talking about Jesus coming and us being raptured up to him. 
For that day will not come unless two things happen. The falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul is saying, don't, don't worry, this day hasn't happened, for this day will not happen. Him coming back and us being gathered together with him, one day will not happen unless there's a great falling away and the Antichrist is exposed. Okay, the pre-tribulationalists say that we won't see the Antichrist. Daniel said we will. Jesus said we will. Paul said we will. And you'll, you'll see in a minute, John says the same thing. Scripture is unified beautifully. The devil is a liar. Listen to this, verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? He's not teaching a different coming. What a joke. This is the same thing. He's reiterating it. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, capital H, who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed. Okay, so God is restraining the Antichrist. In what manner and how he's doing it, scripture ain't clear, but God is restraining the Antichrist until the appointed time. This does not say the church is restraining the Antichrist by the power of our prayers. Because I've heard some pre-tribulationalists say that. What a joke. We couldn't hold back Hitler by the power of our prayers. We couldn't hold back Donald Trump or Joe Biden by the power of our prayers. What a joke. This says God is restraining the Antichrist, not the church. Let's see if I can get out of that sun a little bit. Here we go. And after, he's, after God removes his restraint, verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Remember I told you before, we don't follow miracles. We don't follow signs and we don't follow wonders. We follow Jesus. Jesus is the truth. We follow his truth. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. I just want to, real quick, I'm going to go through... 1 Corinthians 15, 52, famous, famous rapture verse. I do believe in a rapture. I just believe it's at the biblical time when Jesus comes back and the, and the first resurrection happens. 1 Corinthians, this is what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. There's that trumpet again. Remember, Jesus mentioned a trumpet. Paul mentions a trumpet also. And this is the last trumpet, not the first trumpet. Okay, in Revelation, starting in, in, in chapter 6, you got the, you got the seals, the scrolls, and the trumpets. And it goes from the beginning to the end of the tribulation. Okay? And Paul's saying that this is at the last trumpet. He said, for the trumpet will sound again. He puts it at the first resurrection. The dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This is when we'll, we'll lay off our corruptible and put on the incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. This is the rapture at the first resurrection at the last trumpet. Wow, God is awesome. All right, y'all, I'm going to keep this short, but we're going to go through Revelation 13, okay? Just to, to show how you got Daniel, Jesus, Paul, and then John all saying the same thing. God's word is awesome. 
Then I stood on the sand of the sea, 13.1, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Well, we know Jesus Christ will, right? He will reign in victory. He will come down and take authority over this earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We know the end of the book. Verse 5, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Verse 7, It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him, the beast, over every tribe, tongue, and nation. The, the Antichrist will have authority over every nation on this globe. Remember Daniel said that. He will have authority even over the saints, not spiritual authority. He will have them put to death unless they take his mark. Remember Jesus told Pontius, You have no authority over me but that which my Father in heaven had given you. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain at the foundations of the world. You guys, in Revelation 20, I'm going to put the scriptures up because... My battery is about to die and the sun is blinding me. The first resurrection where, where Paul always put the rapture is after the tribulation in Revelation chapter 20. The first resurrection isn't until Revelation chapter 20. So you put all this together and where you have very clear scripture and you have it in multiple, multiple places and everything is perfectly unified. If you find one little verse that ain't real clear on a subject matter and somebody's going to snag that out of context and say it contradicts everything we just read for a Johnny-come-lately doctrine, you can bet and be encouraged that that is a lie. That is a lie. The scripture I just read to you is not debatable. Okay? It's like trying to say, oh, we can now put the LGBT community in the ministry. Okay? It's, there's just things that are not debatable. They're not open for debate. If Jesus said it's sin, it is sin. Okay? If, if he said we're raptured after the tribulation, we are raptured after the tribulation. Okay? All the apostles minus one were killed and martyred for their faith. Some of those people put in the Roman Colosseum had their children eaten by lambs, and by, li by lions in lamb skin. They would put lamb skin on these Christians' children and put them in the Roman Colosseum and allow these beasts to eat them unless they denied their Lord. You guys, this Johnny Come Lately doctrine is making people soft. It's making people weak. And if you remember in Matthew 24 at the beginning, it talks about these hard times coming and then he says, and then many will be offended and fall away. If we're thinking that Jesus is going to take us up and we're not appointed to persecution and we're not appointed to tribulation and then all of a sudden all this breaks out and we realize we have a big decision to make. That's when offense and falling away can take place. You guys, we've got to count the cost. For no man is greater than his master. If they persecuted our Lord, they'll persecute us also. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said, you guys. And when we, we need to start realizing that. And I think that the truth will cause us to dive into our prayer closet, okay? It'll cause us to realize we may have a very tough decision to make coming up. And in and of our own strength, we're not going to make it. 
It's got to be the grace of God working mightily in us. The number one commandment fulfilled within us will empower us to stand up and say, no, I'm not taking that mark. I'm going to serve the Lord my God. He set me free. For Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Look, 10 out of 10, die. If we have to die for our faith, everyone dies anyways. Let it be to the glory of God. Let it be to the glory of God, you guys. Stand strong in these last days. There ain't no easy way out. The Bible in Revelation says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, for their troubles are over. You guys, we have to have an eternal mindset. I want to encourage you to strengthen your faith. The Bible talks about growing in faith. It talks about growing in love. We can build on these building blocks of faith and hope and love. We can be crying out to God and asking Him to strengthen us, helping us to grow in them, asking God to help us to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is faithful, you guys. Leave a, leave a comment. Uh, be nice, but leave a comment. I don't care if you disagree. Uh, I don't know how you disagree. If you disagree, you're, you're thoroughly going right against what Jesus taught very clearly. You know, there is no excuse for it, and there's nothing to take it lightly. Because Jesus laid this out, told us, look for these things. Remember, he rebuked the Pharisees for not, for not being able to see the time that he was here. He rebuked them. He said they could, they, could, they could portray the weather by the sky, but they couldn't tell the signs of the times. We are called to know the signs of the times. We are called to be watchful. That's why he gave us those signs so that we could be ready. We're not in darkness. Okay, we won't know the day or the hour. Okay, we won't. A day is 24 hours, one hour is 60 minutes. We will not know that day, but we will know the season and we will see when it's getting close. Okay, we know prophetically that the temple in Jerusalem has to be rebuilt and we know that the Antichrist has to be exposed. Okay, how exactly all that folds out? I don't know. Are these wars going to lead to it? I don't know. But I'm watching very carefully, you guys. I personally am of the belief that the Antichrist will come from an Islamic nation. I don't believe it's going to be out of the Roman Catholic Church as many believe. I don't know where they see that from. But anyways, you guys, God bless you. Stand strong. Give it all to God. He alone is worthy of it all. We have been baptized and born again. We owe Jesus Christ our life. He is worthy of it. He said to all of you who are weary and laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Jesus is a good God. Jesus is a good God. If you're backslidden or away from the Lord, I encourage you that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. God is quick to forgive. He's quick to forgive. We've got to walk in obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, repent and believe the gospel. We've got to turn from our sin and follow Jesus. We've got to pick up our cross and follow him wholeheartedly. The number one commandment must take root in our heart, that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Bible says, test yourself to see, rather ye be in the faith. Test yourself, humble yourself. What is it? that you are passionate about? What is it that gets you most excited? Is it Jesus or is it football? Is it Jesus or is it basketball? Is it Jesus or is it your paycheck? Is it Jesus or is it your car? Is it Jesus or is it your boat? What are you looking forward to on the weekends? Jesus said, delight yourself in me. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, He'll give us godly desires. We'll now begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We'll, we'll now start seeing and realizing the importance of eternity and the love of God. If you've been baptized in the love of God, nothing can compare. The, now the hot rod just don't attract us like it used to. That fancy car, that fancy paint job, it don't attract us like we used to when we've been born again. Sure, we can say, oh, what a cool car but our heart don't leap for it. We're not thinking about it all the time, y'all. No, Jesus Christ is on the throne of our heart. 
And that's how we got to be. He's coming back for a pure and spotless bride to purify for himself his own special people. Hallelujah. God bless you guys. Thanks for watching this video. Grace and